she's a neurology resident, and she's on her neuro-ophthalmology rotation. She's in her fourth year. Oh, she's going to talk about uh, progressive supernuclear pulses. Thanks, Emily. Thank you guys for having me today. Thanks for the introduction, Emily. I'm going to talk about the neuro-ophthalmic manifestations of progressive supernuclear palsy today um, in regards to a case that I saw on my rotation of neuro -ophthalmology. Oops. So the case that we have um, today is a 70-year-old right-handed man who came into clinic with a three-year history of difficulty reading. He was a previously a really avid reader, so this uh, bothered him greatly that he's had such a hard time. He attributed the change to the fact that he was um, wearing bifocals now, and he just thought, oh, there's something wrong with my prescription, and that's why I'm having such a hard time reading. He also attested to watery eyes pretty much over the same time course as well, but denied any other visual complaints for the, um, for the most part. You can see the pertinent negatives there. Over the same time course, we elucidated that he's also noted frequent falls, and he said that these were pretty much exclusively falls backward, up to five times daily. They would occur even if he was using a cane or had you know, assistive devices with him. There was nothing mechanical that he could pinpoint that was actually contributing to the falls either. He had slow movements overall, had freezing of his gait, and also had a change in the quality of his voice, which to him was kind of strained and kind of quiet, and his family attested to that as well. And he'd had memory difficulty, and he had actually been referred into us from um, the neurocognitive clinic for evaluation of that memory difficulty. His medical history, past ophthalmic history, he'd worn glasses since 2013, and it was really for reading. Um, he did have light sensitivity noted in previous um, optometry notes, but no history of surgeries previously, no patching of the lazy eye as a child. Past medically, he had a history of hypertension, gout, hyperlipidemia, sleep apnea, and prediabetes. Surgically, he had only had a replacement of um, bilateral or bilateral knee um, arthroplasty. Uh, family history was notable for macular de degeneration in his mother. In his social history, he was married, a retired dairy farmer, pretty interesting guy, um, and no history of tobacco, alcohol, or illicit substance use. This is a list of his medications. So for his gout, he was on allopurinol and colchicine. He was on an aspirin, um, Prozac, Lasix. Dinepazil had been started by um, an outside physician for his memory complaints. Uh, Terazosin for BPH, Verapamil uh, for his blood pressure, and then vitamin D and fish oil. His ophthalmic examination, his visual acuity in the right was 20 over 25, on the left 20 over 20, and that was with glasses. His pupils were equally reactive. He had no APDs. His visual fields were full to confrontation. Motility, he had a rather interesting exam. So he had normal pursuit, but then had slow saccades, and this was most notable in upgaze. He had square wave jerks that were nearly continuous and had no inducible optokinetic nystagmus vertically, um, and it was not well formed horizontally. His pressures were equal in both eyes at 18. And stereopsis was notable for um, zero out of three animals and zero out of nine circles, but he got the fly. Slit lamp, notable for a very poor blade weight, and you can see that on general observation as well. And then a lid retraction stare. And his lenses had one plus nuclear sclerosis laterally. His dilated uh, phonoscopic examination was not remarkable. His general neurologic examination showed a uh, masked facies. On his motor exam, these are um, just the pertinent positives that he had. He had increased tone of his, his right um, extremities more than his left extremities, and had increased axial tone with neck movements, which was um, as bad as his worst extremity. And then with coordination, he had reduced amplitude of his rapid alternating movements, and they had decrement as well. So indicative of bradykinesia, and this was more notable on the right more than the left, keeping with his increased tone. He had an outside MRI coming in, and I apologize for the quality of it. It was, um, the slices were a little bit off there. We can see this is a sagittal uh, view of the uh, midbrain and the, and the brain stem. You can see um, it's actually notable for some atrophy within the midbrain. So putting all of this together with his, um, with his complaints clinically of difficulty uh, with, with gait, difficulty with falls over, uh, especially falls backwards over the past couple of years, his cognitive complaints, and then his visual complaints uh, with difficulty reading, 
coupled with his notable findings on neurologic examination and his ophthalmic examination. At this point, we were concerned for a diagnosis of progressive supranuclear palsy. But his, his presentation was pretty classic. So pro progressive supranuclear palsy, or PSP, is a neurodegenerative disorder, and it's due to tau deposition. So similar to the pathology that you would see in Alzheimer's disease or in frontotemporal dementia. It's a type of atypical Parkinsonism, and it's the most common form of atypical Parkinsonism. About 5% of Parkinsonisms that will come through um, a neurology clinic will be PSP. Its onset is in the 60s, and that's the average age range, and that's about 10 years later than you would see in idiopathic Parkinson's disease. Men are affected more commonly than women. The prevalence in incidence is both 5 out of 100,000, but this is, um, this is likely underestimated because it's such a hard diagnosis to make and um, it's under-recognized overall. The mean survival is, is not very good. It's about five to eight years, which is um, pretty low compared to idiopathic Parkinson's disease, which is on average around 20 years or so. And causes, the most common is just idiopathic. You can also have multi-infarct, which is the second most common, and then there are secondary causes that you can see there as well. Like I mentioned, it's an atypical Parkinsonism, so you have the cardinal motor features of Parkinsonism itself with some atypical features that you wouldn't necessarily see in idiopathic Parkinson's disease. So Parkinsonism is defined by tremor at rest, bradykinesia, rigidity, postural instability, a flexed posture, and then freezing and motor blocking. And he had some of those features. And atypical Parkinsonism, you often see ocular dysmotility, that's classic in PSP, early dementia, also classic in PSP, frequent falls, dysautonomia, and ataxia. So the classic clinical features of PSP, and you can see that, I'm not sure how well that projects, um, the hallmark features actually have a little blue star next to them. So the gait disturbance is, is a classic feature. Rigidity, it's mainly an axial rigidity, even though they can't have the, um, they can't have appendicular rigidity as well. Postural instability, it, this occur, occurs very early on in the course of the disease, one to two years, whereas it would be much later in other Parkinsonisms. Frequent unexplained falls, again, super early in the disease, and these are typically falls backward, whereas in Parkinson's, it would be falls forward. And then the ocular motor dysfunction, the motility dysfunction, it, with a vertical supranuclear palsy is hallmark. Retrocolis is also a, a classic feature, with, as well as progressive dementia, and overall, these patients are poorly responsive to dopamine replacement therapy. So only about a third of patients respond to the typical treatments that you would give for idiopathic Parkinson's disease, making it a really difficult um, disease to treat. So the motility abnormalities in our patients had quite a few of these. So there's saccadic abnormalities. Initially, it's slowing of the vertical saccades, which is um, actually the first manifestation. And they um, actually have also an inability to perform volitional saccades. There's also the progressive supranuclear ophthalmoparesis. Um, so there's uh, vertical gaze palsies that can then progress to lateral gaze palsies. Uh, so the vertical will come first and then the lateral can follow. And these can be overcome by the oculocephalic maneuver. But as the disease progresses and there's more tau deposition, uh, the brainstem can become more involved. So this can actually even be lost. And this can also be really hard to assess at times because there's so much axial rigidity. So it can actually be very, very difficult to, to check the VOR in these patients. And I apologize, this, I think when my computer freaked out there, it um, put the, I modified the slides after this, so the videos are in slightly the wrong spots, but I'm going to show you. This, this video is of a patient who has This person with PSP is um, 
much further on than the patient that we saw in clinic who did not have uh, vertical gaze policies yet for the horizontal. And then square wave jerks, which our patient had um, a rapid back and forth mini psychotic intrusions during fixation. And I'll show you a video on that. And then also hallmark or redu is reduced optokinetic nystagmus. Uh, the vertical is affected more than the horizontal, and this is an early predictor of progression to the supranuclear gaze palsy. Eventually there's progression to complete gaze palsy, so vertical and horizontal gaze palsies. Um, there ends up being involuntary <coughs> ocular fixation as well due to the um, involvement with volitional gaze, lack of eye blink, and then they have this characteristic Mona Lisa face or stone face, and these are some of pictures of, of some patients with uh, PSP with that kind of stony face, um, as Dr. Warner mentioned, that downturned mouth, and then they have that furrowed brow, so they almost look angry all the time, and that's due to a Perseris um, contraction. I think that's very unfair to Melissa. I know, I didn't want to see the resemblance, uh, but <laughs> maybe stone face. <laughs> Other ophthalmic manifestations, so ocular dystonias um, can come about, blepharospasm is the most common, it, about 30% of patients with PSP will have it, and then there can also be a apraxia of eyelid opening closure, or both, and about 33% um, as well combined. There's the retraction stare, and then they have a reduced blink rate as well. Visual symptoms that patients will attest to blurred vision, which will be due to decreased blink rate, decreased tear production, um, which, which leads to dry eye overall. Sometimes they'll have diplopia, uh, they can have convergence insufficiency. You can see this in other Parkinsonisms, notably idiopathic Parkinson's disease as well. Photosensitivity, blepharospasm, they may actually complain about that, difficulty with their eye opening. And most will eventually lose the ability to read and to maintain eye contact, and that's largely due to the to the gaze ball. And that was the case, really, in our patient, where um, he really just can't look down through his bifocals to be able to see, to read. So back to our patient again. So the supportive findings by history, as we kind of already previously went over, the early falls, the overall slowness of movements, his visual complaints, notably, most notably the reading, but he also seems to have had some photo, uh, photophobia when we dug a little bit more into his history, and then the change of voice as well. And then his supportive examination findings, really the, some of the early hallmark features from an ophthalmic perspective is, is what this patient had, with the square wave jerks, with his reduced optokinetic nystagmus. 
uh, with his slowed saccades. And then he also had reduced blink rate, a labor traction stare, and neurologically some hallmark examination findings as well with his rigidity, bradykinesia, and postural instability. So PSP is still largely a clinical diagnosis. Um, autopsy can confirm it, but for the most part we are just going based on clinical suspicion for these patients. And classic PSP, which is called Richardson subtype, uh, the criteria were defined in 1996. There have actually been about five additional subtypes elucidated, um, so they think that there may be new criteria coming out soon, but these are the ones that we have to go with. And the possible or, it, possible or probable, um, these are the supporting features, so they, it's a progressive disorder, generally after 40 years, postural instability, the falls, the slowing of the vertical saccades, and a vertical gaze palsy. Definite would require pathologic evidence of the disease. And the most important distinguishing signs of PSP based on these diagnostic criteria are the postural instability and then the supranuclear abnormal crisis. Imaging, um, MRI is probably the most helpful. There are other techniques that they're um, trying to do on a research basis like PET spec, to, um, which can even be used clinically to add additional information, but MR can be the most helpful. So there's notable atrophy um, in the midbrain, in the superior cerebellar peduncles, and the anterior medial thalamic nuclei. Let's see if I can this to work. Oh, oops. Is there a pointer on here? Uh, I think the top. Uh, the top thing? Okay. You can see kind of there in the midbrain region. So it's a, this appearance of a beaked brainstem to the atrophy of the midbrain, and it's called the hummingbird sign. And look, thinking back to the MRI of the patient that we had, he, his sagittal view actually looked like that as well. There have also been studies of the ratio of um, the, the volume of the midbrain to the volume of the pons, and, uh, thinking that potentially this could be used from a diagnostic perspective for PSP as well, because we don't have much else aside from the clinical features to go off of. And there have been uh, two studies that have looked at that, and they noted that PSP has a reduced volume ratio compared to idiopathic Parkinson's disease or mul multiple systems atrophy, which is another type of atypical Parkinsonism. But this isn't routinely used um, from a diagnostic standpoint, necessarily. The pathology, as I mentioned before, is a tauopathy. So there's abnormal tau hyperphosphorylation, which leads to deposition. And the features, a pathognomonic feature of it is the tufted astrocyte, which you can see there. And then neurofibrillary tangles, are aggregates of um, hyperphosphorylated tau as well. The distribution generally sparing the cortex aside from the frontal lobe, which is often affected, and then involving the midbrain, so taking out the ocul or being, uh, involving the oculomotor nuclei, the basal ganglia, the pigmented cells of the basal ganglia, the same ones affected in idiopathic Parkinson's disease are affected, and the subthalamic nucleus, also part of that motor circuit that's affected in Parkinson's disease. And then the cerebellum, so the peduncles are affected in the dentine. The deposition eventually leads to associated gliosis, degeneration, and atrophy, which leads to the hallmark features that we see in PSP. The treatment, there's currently no specific treatment. There are ongoing phase one trials, which are looking at immunomodulatory therapy, um, targeting free tau before it deposits. Those are currently phase one. For the Parkinsonism, a levodopa trial, so the same medication that you would give an idiopathic Parkinson's disease recommended just to see if they're responsive because one third of people will have some kind of response probably not super robust and it probably won't last a long time but they can be responsive for blepharospasm botox injections can be very helpful and you know ideally the treatment of these patients should involve a multidisciplinary team because there's a high chance for morbidity with the postural instability with the frequent falls and the other motor manifestations and then same with occupational therapy for the um, activities of daily living, speech therapy, social work, and palliative care, um, considering that life expectancy is really only five to eight years. So. Um, so general conclusions about our patient. Um, the, you came in with the primary complaint of difficulty with reading, and his visual acuity was intact, his fields were intact, but it was largely due to the, it was due to the fact that he has this gaze palsy at the beginnings of this case policy that are um, resulting in difficulty moving down into his bifocals uh, to be able to read. It's pretty classic for PSP. So I'd like to thank the neuro-ophthalmology team who has um, worked with me all this month. They've been very helpful and very nice to work with, especially Dr. Warner, who uh, had this case with me. Any questions? So like if we see a patient 
like who can't look up? Are there other things that we need to try to rule out in the differential diagnosis? Well, so um, upgaze policies, you can actually see, maybe not a full policy, but you can see upgaze restriction as uh, people age. They can have a little bit of upgaze restriction, and you can see it like commonly in Parkinson's disease as well. Um, so it, it's more the down gaze that's um, the, the one that's more specific for progressive sort of clear policy. I think that you need to keep in mind the whole differential diagnosis of the vertical gaze palsy. Uh, you know, there are metabolic disorders that can do it, and of course, pineal tumors and hydrocephalus can do it. So it has to be the right clinical setting to just say that somebody has PSP. How can we be diagnosing that in a in a 20-year-old, for instance, or even especially in a child? You know, you need to be watching out for uh, you know catastrophic hydrocephalus rather than rather than uh, just thinking uh, PSP. But under the right clinical setting, I think it's a it's a good thought. What about so I think you talked touched on this a little bit, but differentiating it from CPO, the more of um, they can actually move their eyes in PSP is just kind of the initiation of movements. So do you want to take this from CPO? The CPO. Okay, so uh, he's asking about chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia, which is a neuromuscular disorder, not a brain disorder. So supranuclear implies that the nuclei themselves are still working, the muscles are still working, it's just the brain orders to those centers are not working. So uh, with the oculus palate maneuvers, you can get the eyes to move when they can't be moved voluntarily. And, and in the VA, that's like everybody, right? Okay? Nobody seems to be able to follow commands, move their eyes, VA, but if you put that around, they can all move their eyes. In somebody with CPEO, it's really more of a muscle disorder. It's a it's a an atrophic muscle problem. So to the extent that they can move their eyes, they'll be able to move their eyes the same whether they have oculocephalics or to command. So anything that you ask them to do with their eyes, they can do. Whereas somebody with PSP, they may be looking around quite naturally looking, but then when you ask them to look, they can't. And then you can always do the oculocephalic maneuver and see that there is a discrepancy. Uh, they may not be normal with the oculocephalic maneuver, but they'll be better. And it'll be similar with pursuit. So pursuit is a different strategy for moving your eyes. So somebody with PSP may not be able to look down voluntarily, but they may be able to pursue downward. I assume CPO is a younger population. CPO typically will start in the teenage years, but it can occur later. Um, the one thing that is similar is that um, in CPO, often the eye movements are very slow. Um, but you also won't see the lid retraction stare, because most people with CPO have ptosis. And you also won't see the square wave jerks. Uh, CPO is typically associated with fairly large angle deviations in the eyes. Uh, and CPO in its advanced stages, uh, typically patients uh, can still look down Whereas with in advanced PSP, down gaze is the most severely affected. There was a lot of a, little, a lot of verbiage there. One of the uh, words that um, Melissa used was retrocollis, which is backward flexion of the head, the neck, which is a very unfortunate combination with being unable to look down. So if your head is tilted up and you can't look down with your eyes, then that's a double whammy. Is the postural disability worse in this than with regular Parkinson's or the same? Much worse. Okay. This guy had had dozens of falls. Uh -huh. yeah. Dozens. I mean, he would fall numerous times per day, two, three, four, four times a day, backwards with a walker. So in a walker, you're bent forward, right? With a walker, it's, it's almost like you know a lead weight holding you forward, and he still is falling back. Classic is they just fall over backward when they put their head up to look in a cupboard. Boom, where they go, and just for no no reason, there's not a trip and fall. The other thing that, that they'll often say is that when they walk into the room, the cat runs out of the room because <laughs> they will get stepped on. Right out there. So I assume a guy like this would be better with a single vision reader. Exactly. Kind of like yeah. Get his, get his wife to throw in some lubrication because he 
like literally blinks once a minute. Right? And there's there are some studies showing that that um, there's a sort of a, a ratio between blink rate and square wave jerks. So the higher the number of square wave jerks and the lower the number of blinks in ratio makes it more likely that it's going to be PSP. And there are a fair number of studies looking at the eye findings of PSP versus versus Parkinsonism. A lot of people with Parkinsonism uh, complain about blurred vision when they're reading, uh, but usually that's because of the blepharitis. And uh, they, they can have eye movement abnormalities as far as conversions and sufficiency and diversions and sufficiency, uh, but it's different flavor to PSP. They don't have these gaze balls. Thank you, Melissa. Yes. That was great.